last lesson we learned that the coming of the Lord is going to be interruptive in nature. It's going to be accompanied by a shout, by the voice of the archangel, and by the trump of God. The shout of God, a shout of summons for the faithful to come to Him. A shout of victory, open, apparent triumph over the evil one and over all the forces that have conflicted and competed with the kingdom of God. A shout of joy, at last the race of life finished and the battle of faith won. The voice of the archangel, thrust in thy sickle, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And the trump of God a trumpet blast that shall be the last one, summoning people to salvation, summoning them to battle, summoning them to victory. So shall we ever be with the Lord, as He Himself descends with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God. The coming of the Lord is at a set time, and yet that time is not known. Of that day and hour, the scriptures tell us, no man knows. Set time, but unaware of when it precisely it is. We want to deal in this lesson with Jesus coming as a thief in the night. Uncertainty characterizes the time of Christ's return, but not the reality of it. Make no mistake about this. He shall come. When he comes, no man knows. Therefore, we must live in a state of readiness, preparing ourselves to meet the Lord. There is a demand for constant readiness woven all through the Christian system. At no point are you authorized to disband your faith, to step back from the fight of faith and become inactive in the kingdom of God. Never can you occupy the kingdom of God in a state of passivity or unawareness. The Lord may come at any moment, any hour. Woe to that man that is not ready. Consistently throughout the scripture, and this is an arresting thought, every place those that are not ready for the appearing of the Lord are represented, a state of condemnation is summarily announced. What I say unto one, Jesus said, I say unto all, Watch, be ye therefore ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. It is this particular facet of the coming of Christ that is addressed by the phrase, A thief in the night. In 1 Thessalonians, the fifth chapter and verse 2, the apostle says this, For yourselves know perfectly, that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. Again, Peter confirms Paul's testimony with these words in 2 Peter 3.10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. What does this mean, a thief in the night? For some it means a secret return. But this is not the apostolic intent. It is a return that is unexpected so far as its precise time is concerned. Now distortion at this point in your understanding is critical. Take for instance the Thessalonian believers. They believed that the coming of the Lord was going to occur in their generation at any moment. So they quit their jobs and became idle, even became tail bearers, the scripture tells us. Now actually, a correct understanding of the coming of the Lord, rather than stimulating one to quit work, will energize him to work more seriously and consistently for the Lord of glory. He will increase his output rather than diminish it. The coming of the Lord as a thief in the night addresses this matter of you being ready. Jesus spoke about his return in Matthew, the 24th chapter. It is at this particular text of Scripture that Jesus mingled some teaching about the end of the world with some teaching about a judgment upon Jerusalem. This teaching has confused a great many people. It's not our purpose in this series to delineate every text of Scripture in this Matthew 24 context, but to extract here a few verses that teach us that Jesus will indeed come unexpectedly as a thief in the night, which mandates our readiness. Matthew 24, verses 42 through 44 reads, Watch therefore, 
for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. But know this, that if the goodman of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. Unexpectedly, Jesus will come to break up the house of the ungodly. Those that have made their investments in this world alone, that have sown to the flesh, shall in that day have all of their resources and all of their possessions taken from them. He will come to break up the house, to spoil, to plunder, and to rob from the ungodly those fading tinsels and baubles of life in which they have made their investments. Be aware, in such an hour as you think not the Son of Man cometh, so do not devote your attention or fasten your affection upon the things that shall disappear when Jesus comes again. In 1 Thessalonians, the fifth chapter, verses 2 through 8, the apostle gives some extended instruction about the coming of the Lord. He associates it again with readiness, alertness, preparedness. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction shall come upon them as travail upon a woman with child and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. The night time moral night when the souls of men are insensitive and not alert when they have been distracted from the Lord of glory to the things that have been cursed by God. The world is going to pass away in the lust thereof and anyone and everyone wherever they may be that fastens their affection on these things will be robbed when Jesus comes again. Sudden destruction shall come upon them as a thief spoiling them in the middle of the night. Even though Jesus Christ has announced with consistent clarity that he's coming again and has alerted us to what will happen when he comes again. The heavens shall pass away, the earth shall pass away, the works that are therein shall be burned up, the world and the lust that is therein shall pass away. All the humanity will be called into account to him. Every eye shall see him, even they that pierced him. All the nations of the earth shall wail because of him. Even though he's alerted the human race in spite of that, in spite of a clear, concise revelation, vast segments of humanity have devoted themselves to the part of life that shall pass away. To them, Jesus will come as a thief. But not to you if you're living by faith. You're living in the day. In the light of God's revelation, you're anticipating his coming. To you, he will not come as a thief. To you he will come as a welcome Savior to rescue you from that realm with which you're incompatible, in which you're a stranger and a pilgrim. Only those that are of the darkness and only those that are of the night will experience Jesus coming as a thief. To everyone else, they're looking for him. To them he does not come as a thief, but as a Savior. Peter adds his confirmation to this when he says in 2 Peter 3.10, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief of the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. That is the ultimate robbery that this world shall experience. When the Lord Jesus himself wrests from their fleeting grasp the things that he cannot receive in the world to come. Anything and everything that's not compatible with heaven, will be snatched away when Jesus comes again and unsaved souls, unreconciled souls would enter into eternity completely incompatible with the world to come. A dreadful thought indeed. In Revelation, the third chapter in verse 3, 
Jesus deals with a lethargic and a dead church. Without being overly critical and not intending for this to be a series of exposures of a deficient, deficient and defective church, I will say this. That today there exists this same condition. A church that has departed from the living God. That is not ready for the Savior to come whose eyes are not fastened on the Lord of glory. Jesus addresses just such a church in these words. Revelation the third chapter verses 1 through 3. And under the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works, that thou hast a name that thou livest, and are dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come unto thee. To an indifferent church, Jesus says, If you're not looking for me, if you're not anticipating me, if you're not longing to see me, to you I will come as a thief. And a thief robs and plunders. He brings no gifts. Jesus will only bring gifts and rewards to those that are looking. Be aware. I may be speaking to someone now whose works are defective before God. You currently do not have an acceptable relationship with God through Christ. You're living at a distance from God. Jesus speaks to you. Watch. Don't let me catch you unaware. If you're not watching, I'll come to you like a thief and I will take from you the things in which you have invested all of your life. There's no need for you to be in that number. Provision has been made for you to come away from the cursed order. In Revelation, the 16th chapter, in verse 15, Jesus addresses a similar word to those people that were walking in his name. Behold! I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. The Lord does not want to catch you unaware. It is possible to spend all of your life clothing yourself with religiosity that will be found pointless and vain and without value when Jesus comes. Make sure, listener, that when Jesus comes, he does not take from you the religion you have currently invested in. Be found clothed with the righteousness of Christ at His appearing. Nakedness and shame to be zealously avoided in the presence of God. Now let's draw some preliminary conclusions from these remarks of our Lord Jesus. I come as a thief in the night. There is nothing in any of these texts that indicates secrecy. Everything about them is open and apparent. The breakup of the house of the ungodly will not be accomplished secretly. It is something that will be open or apparent. That's what makes it a breaking up of the house of the ungodly. When the apostle said, sudden destruction shall come upon them when he comes to the thief in the night, that is not something that's private, not something that's imperceptible, not something that's secret. Sudden destruction is public in nature. It's open and apparent. It shall happen when he comes as a thief in the night. The heavens passing away with a great noise and the elements melting with fervent heat is not something private. It's public by its very nature. I will come on thee as a thief, he says to a retarded church. That's not something that's private. It's something that's public. Finality characterizes everything about these texts. The very fact that Jesus shall come as a thief in the night has a certain final note to it. It's going to be what I have chosen to call the great wrap-up of the scheme of redemption. 
He will come no more when he comes like a thief in the night. Now actually, this teaching is in perfect harmony with everything that's taught us by Jesus and the apostles. They have extended themselves to show us how to live in view of the imminent return of our Lord. One of the characteristics of the kingdom of God is this. Perfect consistency is woven throughout all of it. Everything God does blends with what He is going to do. And God at no point does something that's out of harmony with what He is or what He's said. Now notice these teachings of Scripture and consider them in view of the fact that Jesus will come as a thief in the night to rob, to spoil, and to plunder the ungodly. Make no mistake about this. Whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. He that sows to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. He that sows to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. If you, in your life, have devoted your intellectual, your emotional, and all of your other capacities the things that are temporal in nature, that are not valid before God, that do not harmonize with God, things that make no room for Jesus, things that do not require fellowship with Jesus, if you have devoted yourself to these sort of things, when Jesus comes again as a thief in the night, He will take these things from you, and you will find that what you thought was so valuable in this life was worthless. You shall have lived in vain. Jesus, drawing attention to this in his Sermon on the Mount, said this, Matthew 6, verses 19 and 20, Lay not up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt and thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through and steal. This is not something that should be taken lightly. Where are your treasures, the things you value? Are they laid up in heaven? If they are, they will not be taken from you when Jesus comes again. But if you have placed your values and your heart and your affection on treasures on earth, they will be taken from you when Jesus comes again. The reason for Jesus' words is because He wants you to be ready when He comes again. Don't lay up for yourselves treasures that will be taken from you when Jesus comes again. In Colossians, the third chapter, verses 1 through 3, the apostle deals with the matter of our affection. He says, If ye then be risen with Christ... Seek those things which are above, where Christ sits on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth, for ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. There are things above, brother, sister. There are things above which you can appropriate. In summary form, the apostle mentions some of these things in Romans the 14th chapter. He says, the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Now those things are yours if you seek them. They're there for you. But if you do not seek them, the kingdom of God is of this nature. What you do seek will be taken from you at the time when you need resources. Seek those things that are above, so that you will not be robbed when Jesus comes as a thief in the night. In Hebrews, the 12th chapter, verses 1 and 2, the Holy Spirit is admonishing us to conduct ourselves in this world as those that are anticipating the next world. Here's what he said. Wherefore, seeing we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race set before us, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down on the right hand of the throne of God. 
Now consider our Lord Jesus Christ. When he was in this world, Satan offered him the kingdoms of the world and all the glory of them. One of the initial great temptations that confronted our Lord. But the Lord looked beyond this world to a time when the kingdoms of this world would become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ. He refused what Satan offered now because something better was up ahead. The same is true with you. Better things are ahead. You may be deprived of resources and riches here, but make no mistake about this. Jesus is bringing eternal riches to those that have laid treasures up in heaven whose appetites and affections have been honed up and developed for eternal things. Look to Jesus. Hebrews 11, chapter verses 10 through 6, 10 and 16 tells us that the early pilgrims that lived before Christ journeyed in the promised land as in a strange land. It says, they looked for a city which hath foundations whose builder and maker is God. Now notice how consistent this is with what we're teaching here, that Jesus is coming as a thief in the night. People that have lived by faith all through divine history have seen that what's ahead is worth more than what's at hand. Jesus clarifies it by saying, when I come again, I'm going to take away what the world considers valuable, but I'm going to bring what is truly invaluable. Now you conduct yourself in harmony with that revelation. Seek a city that has foundation. Set your affection on things above. Look to Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. And don't forget to cast off the sin and the weight which so easily besets you and impedes you. Anything in your life that conflicts with the purpose of Christ, anything that dulls your appetite for the things of God is to be put away from you. Because if it's not, when Jesus comes as a thief in the night, he'll take it away anyway. So why not let him take it away now in the great work of redemption and salvation? In 2 Thessalonians, the third chapter in verse 5, Paul prayed for the church that their hearts would be directed into a patient waiting for Christ. A patient waiting for Christ. Patience in Scripture denotes consistent effort in the face of conflict, in the face of difficulty. They kept running the race, even though it was hard. They set their affection on things above, even though it was difficult. Even though they had to occupy a straight and a narrow way, buffet the body, bring it under subjection, crucify the flesh, deny ungodliness, they did it because they saw their hope and glory was worth all of these things. Now if I'm speaking to anyone here who is not patiently waiting for Christ, I'm not going to ask you why you aren't patiently waiting. I already know why. It's because you have not considered that it is more valuable to wait for Jesus than to expend your energies for this present evil world. Come away now from that sort of thinking. It's unacceptable in the kingdom of God. Jesus shall come as a thief in the night to you, unless you're ready. First Peter 2 and verse 11, Peter steps back and he sees the people of God. The lust of the flesh and the lust of the eye and the pride of life are tugging at their spirit. Satan, like a roaring lion, is walking to and fro, seeking whom he may devour, trying to turn our eyes away from a coming Christ. Peter shouts into the church. He says, I beseech you, as strangers and pilgrims abstain from fleshly lusts, that war against the soul, that tend to make you unready, unprepared for the return of the Lord. If you do not conquer the world, the world will conquer you. And if it does, Christ will come as a thief to rob, to plunder, and to destroy. The church at Corinth had some difficulties among their number. They had difficulties with morality as well as with doctrinal issues. 
And the apostle admonished them in 1 Corinthians 7.31 to conduct themselves as those that used the world and not abusing it, for the fashion of this world passes away. Never truer words were said. The fashion of this world is passing away. You use the world. Don't let it use you. Whatever you have of this world, hold it lightly. Get ready to let go of it. Because when Jesus comes as a thief in the night, you're going to have to relinquish all of your earthly treasures and possessions. Don't let them dominate you now in this life. When Jesus comes, he's going to remove everything that's incompatible with eternity. He's going to shake the things that can be shaken, that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. Hebrews 12, 27. Beneath the things that are seen, far beyond sensually observed things, a kingdom exists. It's an eternal kingdom. Hebrews, the 12th chapter, tells us that we have received this kingdom that cannot be moved. When Jesus comes again, He's going to shake the kingdom that can be shaken. All the seen things, all the temporal things, like a mighty scaffold, will fall to the ground. And what is left will be the eternal kingdom that's been right under your nose. Jesus is coming as a thief of the night to take away the scaffolding, to take away the temporary kingdom, the seen things, the things for which the flesh lusts. Be ready for his return. Those that have their affection and treasures set upon these temporal things will be found naked and they will be subjected to shame before the Lord's Christ. Only those that live in ignorant of eternal verities will be found unawares. So the inevitable question that you must ask yourself is this. Will I be ready when Jesus comes? Or will he come to me like a thief? 